is this big red button push. So, hello, am I live? Am I live? Can you hear me? <laughs> hey, good afternoon, good after morning, whatever time it is for you. It is Friday, two o'clock central time, and that means it's time for us to get together for dramas. Dave Rush, Ask Me Anything, and Scott. I am Dave Rush, Senior Instructor at Total Seminars. Yeah, that's where I work, I remember. And working in the background today with me, as always, is my partner in Pi, Scott Jernigan, Senior Editor for Total Seminars and a million other hats, uh, co-author, author. Uh, he was helping clean the office the other day, so janitorial. <laughs> He's got it all. Hey, well, good afternoon. It is Friday. It's Pi Day Friday or drama. And we get together every Friday at two o'clock central time, central daylight savings time or central standard time, whichever it is. It's always two o'clock. It's the same. And we talk about CompTIA certifications in the focus of Raspberry Pi. Very good. <laughs> Scott is so much funnier than you guys could ever possibly recognize. He, uh, he plays the straight man to Mike when he is on camera with him, but uh, he is just hilarious as he shares notifications on the back channel. What is going on here? I got some weird, oh, I see what that is. Okay, we can, I can fix that. Click, it's fixed. Anyways, so we get together, we talk about Raspberry Pis as a tool to study and prepare for CompTIA exams, our bailiwick is A+, plus, Net+, plus, Security+, plus, IT Fundamentals+. Plus. Scott wrote that book. Mike wrote the others. Uh, ostensibly, Mike wrote the others, and a good deal of help and all editing from Scott. And we have more products out there. Of course, we have lots of uh, video products on all kinds of different platforms. The one most people are most familiar with is the stuff that we have on Udemy, but we have some uh, other outlets. And when I'm... Uh, <laughs> I'm watching the the YouTube thread, the uh, the YouTube chat thread here. You guys are funny people, <laughs> and I'll come and talk about those in a minute. At any rate, so we have some other platforms, and uh, I moderate all of the platforms, uh, all of the the classes and lessons and lectures and everything on Udemy and all the other platforms. But again, mostly you don't know those, so we can just ignore them. Hey, we got a good day today. Um, I have a fun project. I have an easy project that is so powerful and so flexible and so easy to do. Uh, it's just going to be a, a oodle tons of fun. So I'm looking at back channel notes here. Okay, I can ignore all that. Uh, let's see what's good in my notes that I'm supposed to do. Scott's moderating the YouTube channel on the back. Uh, so you can talk to him. If you're here watching live, you send a uh, start type a message to at Scott and you will find him. If you want to send something to me at start type in Dave and my name will pop up. If I see uh, ats to other people, then you guys are having your own conversation and I encourage you to do that. That always leads to someplace good, almost always. Uh, but I will skip over those messages. I'm here to, to answer questions that you post to me, though sometimes I get sucked into stuff that Tullowit does. <laughs> no, I'm going to disagree with that one, Tullowit. We are here to advance technical training as we're isolated during the COVID crisis, uh, which is spiking again. Goodness gracious, not supposed to spike in the middle of summer, right? So, but here we are. This is the 50th drama, which means in two weeks, technically, it's actually a little less, but. Uh, we're going to do the one-year anniversary show, and man, I got good stuff planned for that. And as everybody who's watching right now knows, we got giveaways on that one. I've got uh, half a dozen giveaways scheduled so far, and I'm going to try and hit the boss up for just a couple extra bucks and add some RPI Picos in there. You know, three, four bucks a piece, so we can get those shipped out. It should be an interesting thing, but. Uh, we're giving away Raspberry Pi kits. We are, of course, giving away Total Tester, and I'm, I'm not sure what all else. This is a presentation of Total Seminars. 
the Mike Myers company, as everybody calls it. Mike Myers, our president and author in chief, uh, written millions of copies. He hasn't written millions of copies, but uh, we're the number one seller of CompTIA Trifecta prep books. And Mike has written those and Scott has co-written some. And uh, he has uh, given me the time on Friday to get together to talk with you about this interesting side approach to studying for CompTIA. Mike gets together with you guys twice a week on Monday and Wednesday, two o'clock central time, this very same channel. Sometimes he does special features. Excuse me. I don't hiccup except when I'm talking to you guys. Every week, I can count on hiccups every Friday at 2 o'clock. Uh, so Mike sometimes does special features. Sometimes he just uh, takes questions all uh, as long as his AMA last couple, last Wednesday, not this past Wednesday, but the week before he did a, a great presentation on TPM chips and the differences between the new ones and the old ones and how they're uh, going to, at least as far as we know at this point, uh, be manifest in the new Windows 11 release. Uh, when that comes out, there's no official announcement date, but all the buzz around the internet says October. Windows 11 in October, that is, that's fascinating. It's exciting. And just such a quick turnaround from the, the time that the leaks came out to a possible release. So we'll see if that happens. It'd be interesting. <clears throat> So I haven't figured out how I'm going to call this thing or some other product Andromeda, but it's got the drama in there. So we got to do something fun with it. So this is a Dave Rush Ask Me Anything and Scott. Uh, and that means it's your job to make this show happen by asking us anything. Uh, we're good for any topic here that's technical. We don't do religion or politics, of course. But uh, if you got tech topics, it doesn't have to be CompTIA, it can be computer, it can be Quantum physics. No, don't take me down the quantum physics road if you don't have an actual question. <laughs> right now, people are charging all over Wikipedia saying, what does somebody not know about quantum physics? Let's ask Dave uh, and befuddle him. And that's not a difficult thing to do. <laughs> I am befuddled. Man, I am befuddled. I was prepping show uh, and it was, it's was it been a busy week. And so I haven't had much show prep time and I didn't come up with a topic that made me happy until Tuesday. And I'm working my brains out on Tuesday and Wednesday and do a, a lesser degree on Thursday. No, I'm as busy as I'll get out on Thursday. So working late nights, working late nights. But by Wednesday night, I had all the labs done and tested and they were working great and I'd made good notes. And so all I had to do last night was transfer those notes into my outline, uh, add a little bit more fill out and some background information, some goodies like that. And I, I anticipated about an hour's worth of writing. And uh, so I started at nine o'clock or so and wrote for three hours. <laughs> and then I was doing the last thing that I needed to do. And that's to pull some files off of the host that we're gonna use, uh, some screenshots that I took uh, so that I could put them into my little notes folder here and make a zip file and put it on my um, my web server that I make available to you, the, all these archived documents. And I, I ran an SCP command, a secure copy. It runs over SSH and copies files. And it failed. It said, uh, connection refused from the host. And so, well, maybe there's something funky. And I tried putty instead of SCP. Connection refused. I won't go all through the things that I tried, but after two hours, it's two o'clock in the morning, I said, oh man, this thing is hosed. I was, I was just sure it was a, I was sure early on after the initial failures that it was a firewall setting. And I worked on the firewall for a very long time and it just didn't yield me any results. And so I resolved to get up early. I'll go to bed at two o'clock in the morning. I'll get up really early and I will uh, blast the, the system and do a fresh reinstall. And that hurt my heart. This is a host that we set up 
on about the third show, and it's been running nonstop for the last year for all intents and purposes. Uh, it has so many things on it. It's got my backup web server. It has just tons and tons and tons on it. And it would have killed me, it will kill me, to have to have blasted it away. Uh, the install itself, a fresh install is, to use Mike's word, uh, trivial. It's No, it's not trivial. It's very, very simple. That's the right word. But then putting back on all the servers and processes and data and everything, uh, that was going to be horrible. So I stand up to go to bed because I have to do it. And as I'm reaching to shut down the computer, I said, wait a minute. There is the one obvious, no way this could have happened thing that I haven't tried yet or I haven't looked at. And so when I set this server, it's like, yeah, I guess it's a server. It's got many servers in it. When I set it up a year ago, uh, I made it a DHCP server. So my DHCP router hands out an address and that IP address has not changed in the last year, 1.141. And all of my utilities are set to access that uh, at 141, at least so I thought. There was one, that, one thing that was working uh, and that was VNC, but everything else was failing. Um, FTP was failing. I got connection refused. Uh, my web servers were failing. There's a an HTTP and an HTTPS server that failed. SSH failed. It all failed uh, except VNC. And I never, until that last second when I'm ready to go, but I said, wait a minute, why does VNC work? And I was in that using VNC, checking listening ports and net statting and doing commands that we haven't talked about in here. like. Uh, LSOP, LSOFP, and uh, <laughs> I thought, well, wait a minute, here's the one thing that I didn't check, uh, and that's the IP addresses of both the wireless LAN and the Ethernet LAN. So I ran an IP space A, the new, that's the replacement for IF config, and the Wi Fi address is just the same as it's been for the last year, 1.129. And it turns out that I have uh, my VNC calling to 129. But the Ethernet LAN had changed from 141 to 142. And all the utilities that I was accessing or attempting to access with it were calling on 141. So I just tried a putty session with 142. Bing, I'm in and changed my web browser call to 142, bing, it's in. And everything else that I tested on 142, bing, it's in. I have a theory as to why it changed. Uh, my initial theory was all the testing that I did on this server Tuesday night and Wednesday night, uh, I installed and uninstalled zillions of things and some of them had some real problems uh, in either direction, sometimes installing, sometimes uninstalling. And I figured that must have mangled some internal process. But no, my theory is I've got a pile of a stack of five pies in a cluster up here. And early this week, the lights stopped blinking on one of them. And I did some hardware troubleshooting on it. It's dead. Um, I got nothing to add to that. It's dead. So it's a static IP address. This can't be the problem. But I thought, okay, well, there's a, another address that's not being recognized by DHCP. Maybe it's sucked back uh, my 141 into the pool. I don't know what the cause is. And uh, I didn't want to mess with it and do a static last night. So problem solved. But I am really groggy because I was up till 2 o'clock. And I was only planning on being up till 10 o'clock. Uh, and I had to get up early and make sure everything was cool and copacetic. So I'm living on four hours of sleep, plus all the prep that I have to do today to get this stuff. So, <laughs> all right, long, boring story. Sorry about that. Uh, let me do one thing here ever so quickly, and then we'll take a look at the YouTube chat. Special discounts are back. And to celebrate them being back, we're not doing the usual ones. The usual ones are total tester and total sims or bundles thereof. But uh, marketing department said, no, 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 we it, it's been a long time and we've got this problem solved. So we would like to do a whole shiny new kind of discount or, or discount on products. That's a good place to do that. 
And so share screen, click this, the screen is shared. So the Q&A special for this week is 50% off bundles. It's the A plus ebook bundle. That's the exciting part of it. And total tester for A plus or this bundle, the network plus ebook and the network plus total tester bundle. So it's already insanely low priced for that bundle. You go in there, uh, you uh, go to totalsem.com, www.totalsem.com. Put that swag in your basket. Pick up some other swag while you're at it. And then when you check out, use the code 071921. Uh, that's US format for month, day, and year. That's Monday, beginning of this week. And uh, that's good through this Sunday. No, I don't know what time. I never do. It's just, I'm always told it happens on Sunday because then a new, if there's going to be a new special, it happens on Monday. So check that out, man. If you're looking to, to study A plus or network plus at this time, that's the answer. And I can't imagine it will be very long before they will be able to build the uh, 601 bundle. But we shall see. That's uh, above my pay grade, as they say. All right, well, let's see who's here and what kind of talk is happening. Uh, yeah, I'll do that. All right, passing the top of the hour here with Tullowit checking in at 58, my spicy shirt. I like this one. It's the only Hawaiian that I have that has substantial amounts of red in it. And I just think it's so pretty. I love when the rotation comes around for this one. Dave is feeling saucy, saucy, spicy, exhausted, timestamp. Okay, yeah. Um, so if you're uh, following along with me on the chat, if you posted a question and you want to say, uh, hey, did Dave miss my question or has Dave not gotten yet to my question? There are two things that you can do. First of all, above the uh, chat window, uh, it defaults, uh, YouTube does, to top chat and top chat is when YouTube becomes the auto ban hammer or, or filters out anything that it thinks a human would filter out. So if you will just click that little down arrow and change it from top chat to live chat, you'll see everything that everybody posts. And then to the right of that, there are the three vertical dots, which is called a kebab. I can't tell you, I spent hours after work researching it and all the possible names and the name is Kebab. That's what the programmers who use the language that created this interface call that thing in their programming language. So there's no disputing it. It's a kebab. Nonetheless, if you click the, the kebab, you can toggle timestamps on. So you will know when I'm reading a timestamp, hey, Dave Rush posted a message at 1.47. Uh, if you posted your message, you'll know what time it is. And I try and identify what time uh, the messages that I'm reading right now, and you'll know if I've gotten to your question yet or haven't, or if I've skipped it. And if I skip a question, it happens sometimes. I, I read fast and I've got five different windows open here. Uh, just post it again down uh, uh, fresh and, and I'll take another whack at it when we get there. Uh, Kumaran KM asks if he can get the Discord link. Scott is my poster of links for the most part today. So uh, if <laughs> dang right, it's called a kebab hashtag. Uh, Scott, if you're, I think you're listening. I know you are. Uh, if you would post the Discord link, we will identify it. Expect it now in the next minute right now. It's about uh, 19 minutes after two o'clock my time. So probably at 20 after, oh, there we go. And Scott says, I posted it at 207, way back there. Okay. <laughs> I see Scott's messages. He does, he talks to me on the back channel, so I don't read his messages. I should have done that. Okay. Check 207, Kumaran. Kumaran, probably. I apologize if I butchered your name. We got a lot of different cultures represented here, and I think that's wonderful. I think it's great. I really do. Scott Jernigan, very cool. So many projects, so few years left to try them. <laughs> Scott has also posted the uh, discount and the code at time 215 for the bundles that are on special this week. <laughs> that was a good troubleshooting story, huh? Oh, man, if you'd been here, uh, I don't drink. 
very, very, very rarely, but I was so, the only reason I didn't is it was such a, a slog to figure it out. Man, I spent a lot of time on firewalls. Crazy homebody girl just stopping in to say hi. Hello, hello. Nice to see you. Okay, I spelled it right. <laughs> the only question is whether or not I pronounced it right. My culture is a Petri dish. Yeah, yogurt. That's the joke I would have gone for. Hey, Tullowit, before the uh, the show started, I posted a uh, a thread of three lyrics pieces and the answer the it's a it's a contest that was pretty much targeted for you no it's not everybody i'm not giving a prize away today <laughs> mike is not author me authorized to give let me give prizes every show like he does <laughs> but uh if anybody wants to take a whack at my little contest there a million years ago i used to be a dj at night and uh i would have a contest very much like what i just uh, posted there. I'd, I'd do three songs in a row uh, that had a common thread and uh, folks would call in and uh, participate in the contest that way. So I miss doing that. I thought I'd do that textually speaking. What are good web this time, Mark? 220 Kevos Films. What are good websites to apply for IT jobs besides Indeed or LinkedIn? Monster. We put together a list of the best tech-centric job sites in 2021. We did do that. All right. I'm going to do heads down here for a second. I've got the, we did that in 2021, huh? I'll take you, I'll take you at your word and search 21. Sites. No match. Job. Jobs, job types, upcoming presentations about applicability. I right, check the archive. I'm going to put the links up here in a second. That was a copy and paste from another website. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I thought that we did one with job sites though, too, with, with one of our guests, uh, maybe Debbie Strauch or somebody like that. Uh, but do check. I, I, I know here I'm looking at the jobs, job type certifications and things like that. Mike did a show uh, on January 25th of this year. So check the archive for that. Certifications in job hunting, job hunting, feeling well qualified, underqualified. Mike talks about getting IT jobs with certifications at older ages. Resumes, job focus. Okay, we talked resumes on that one. Okay. So I don't have that one here. But Scott's got it uh, posted, then Cool Bananas. Um, so, Mont, yeah, those are the big three. Now, there's all, there are other job sites and job hunters out there. Uh, you can go to recruiter job sites. They're not the worst thing in the world. Um, you got to go through them, and they negotiate on your behalf. Of course, they get their cut. Um, those are my big three. I mean, I go to um, cleared jobs. If you... Uh, happen to hold uh, any U.S. government clearances, uh, Cleared Jobs is a great place. They get all the government jobs that require clearances and post them. Uh, and then whatever Scott's posted, that's the answer. All right. Sorry, I wish I could be more helpful. I, I will uh, compile a job site list with the, the info that Scott had. Uh, and my own research and whatever. And I'll see if we can post that in our uh, Total Seminars uh, Cool Tools area or the blog area or something like that. So that when somebody asks this question, hey, what's a good place to job hunt? Uh, we can just give you a link to our list. So let me put that in my list or in my things to do here. Compile and post job sites list. Okay. That was a good question, Kavos. I went to your site once. When I saw your name ages ago for the first time, Kavos Films, I went that. I'm gonna go over there, I better find some cool indie films. Uh, and I do this to so many people. I don't remember what I saw, but I, as I recall, I wasn't disappointed. My two cents is in. What was your first IT job? Did you like it? 
Uh, my first IT job, I'll do this for a couple minutes because I do want to get onto the stuff in, in the program today. Uh, I worked for a company called Amdeck. Amdeck is, was one of the first companies to create alternative monitors for, uh, well, they made them for terminals for, you know, big IBM mainframes and mini computers and uh, deck mini computers and things like that. Uh, and then when IBM came out with the first PC, uh, Amdeck started making monitors that would work for those. So you didn't have to buy uh, a $6,000 IBM green text only monitor. You could buy an amber one from Amdeck. Uh, and uh, by the time I joined them, they were uh, doing a little more than monitors. Uh, we did monitors and we did video cards and uh, we started branching out into some other products. And my job was a sales engineer, which the way they operated it really had very little to do with sales. Uh, I was attached to a sales guy. We were in New York and uh, we would meet at the airport five days a week, Monday through Friday. And he would have four or five different customers that we would visit that day, fly to Buffalo, go see this customer, and my sales guy would tell them about all the cool new things that we were making and selling and the things that they would do. And then while he uh, was done with his project and getting prepped for us to leave, it was my job as the sales engineer to tell the customer the truth about what we did or what the products would do and what they wouldn't do. Uh, and it was just a ton of fun. Yes, I loved it. I enjoyed it. I got uh, my first exposure to business travel. I got a lot of business travel done. Uh, most of that was up in the Northeast Corridor, of course. It was all quick flights, 40 minutes and less. But that kind of led to a lot of other jobs, and here I am doing this. So, yep, I liked it. I loved it. Uh, my background, I guess you can't call that IT, right? That's electronics. I, so I, I moved from there to designing motherboards for a clone company, and from there, uh, let's call that my next IT, I, real IT job, and that was uh, working for Novell as one of their instructors. Novell Netware is a big networking uh, software company back in the 80s. All right. You should do a Pi podcast. You could call it Pirate Radio. I'll bet it's done. Hi, Patricia Grace. <laughs> Pirates and parrots. <laughs> well, seminars channel on YouTube is indexed and searchable, by the way. I have not, uh, I got permission to put my indices up. I haven't done that yet. Uh, I'm way behind, but they're done. So uh, one of these days I will sit down for five, five hours uh, and get all those indexes posted. Uh, conversations among the way, people checking in with each other. Okay, so Scott posted uh, a good job collection site, KVOS at 224, if you didn't find that already. Uh, and KVOS says also on the Discord server with Total Seminars, Kivo, oh, you're Kivo the Cub President. Cub, Club President. That's easy to say. Cub President. I like that. Okay, great. Uh, and Scott will probably post up the uh, Discord channel link here shortly. There is an unofficial Total Seminars Discord channel that was made by Hode, Jose Braden. See, I'm tired. I just can't speak today. Uh, that's got lots and lots and lots of good folks hanging out there, smart folks. There's lots of topics and subtopic areas. Uh, sometimes we get together after the AMAs with mics and cameras, and we invite you to do the same, and we'll have face-to-face -face conversations. But people are on there 24 hours a day, and if you've got a, a thought, a question on Linux or Apple Pies or tech support in general or studying or whatever, anything that uh, is kind of quasi-related to the things that uh, we talk about a total seminars, head on over to the discord channel when Scott posts that and uh, you'll see great people there all the time. I will not be on tonight after the show for a reason that we've talked about in the past. Is it true that you can make over a hundred thousand in networking it? I'm going to assume you're talking a hundred thousand dollars. The answer to that is yes. Um, not as an entry job. You're not going to say, hi, I've got a, a bachelor's uh, of arts and a, an A plus certificate, hire me and pay me a hundred thousand, but it does not take long, uh, not too many years to clear that hundred thousand mark. You, you're going to want uh, some management experience there. They want people who can be team leaders as well as knowledgeable folks 
in their technical fields. Uh, and then you apply those two together. But there are uh, hands-on technician folks uh, who, after some years, that's not something you're going to do in three years. It's going to be something you're going to do in uh, 10, 12 years, perhaps, if you're just doing uh, wrenching. But yes, you can make $100,000. Uh, and you should, uh, in 10 years, 15 years, at today's numbers, uh, with management, break well past that. All right, Scott just posted the Discord link at 229. So please join after uh, there's a if I can even if I can't make it and Scott and Mike can't make it on Fridays because right after uh, our AMA they have a meeting with the publisher and of course they're in the middle of writing uh, the new Network Plus book so they're gonna skedaddle right away. Okay, <laughs> I do like your Discord name. All right, well, that gets us caught up on, oh, what are we in? It's almost caught up. San Dimas High School football <laughs> rules, okay. All right, back to my notes then. I mention this all the time, but people are new all the time. In fact, I've seen at least one new name today, I believe. Uh, we do projects with Raspberry Pis. Those projects are intended to help foster our studies for various CompTIA certifications. Sometimes we do projects just because they're fun and sometimes they fall in a little bit between, uh, not quite a tight CompTIA objective, but not quite frivolous, fun, and interesting. Uh, that's gonna be the case today. It, it definitely touches on aspects of a number of CompTIA certifications. But if you don't have a Raspberry Pi, what can I do, Dave? I'm glad you asked that. Many of the projects that we do can be done on other computers, uh, other Linux distros. So uh, if you've got that old beat up machine you had, don't know what to do with, install a copy of Ubuntu or Mint or something like that on there, or on your regular daily driver, create a virtual machine using Microsoft Hyper-V or Oracle Box uh, Virtual Box. Yeah, Oracle's Virtual Box, uh, my personal favorite for the last few years. Uh, you got a little more money than I do, you can open, uh, get yourself a copy of VMware. Yes, I know there's free versions, but you can't make VMs with them. The free version is a player. You can run existing VMs, but you can't create new ones. So today's project can be done on other Linux distros, but I think it's a lot of fun to do it on a Pi because, uh, well, you'll see, it's, it's, much, it's very relevant to the Pi. Ooh. I'm interchange. I mangled something here. Today's project. We'll just do this. If you download today's archive documents from pyrsquare.zapto.org, Scott, if you'd be so kind, throw that link up. Today's project. Cool tools with Pi apps. Uh, there's a typo in the document there that says today's project is OpenCV. Uh, it's not. It's uh, Cool Tools with Pi Apps. So where we've been and where we're going. Last week, we installed and configured an audio streamer of a box called Volumio. You can do that on a standalone little Pi. You don't need monitors or anything like that. Because once you install it, it is 100% operated and configured by a web browser. Now you gotta have a web browser in, I don't need that yellow paper on there, in another computer on this same network to access it and control it and to uh, copy music files up to it and things like that. But man, I have been playing with this thing for a long time, somewhere between seven and 12 weeks. I can't remember when I first started playing with it. And uh, man, I had a fight with it for five weeks maybe a little longer than that, seven weeks, something like that. Uh, it worked, but it, there were things that I expected it to do that it didn't do. And uh, there was a boot problem. It always booted up if I had a keyboard and could make it happen. But uh, a couple of weeks ago, I figured out all the problems and I had never intended to do it as a drama feature. But once I got all those bugs worked out and, and I said, all right, now let's do a fresh one from scratch. It goes boom, 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 boom. 
and it's really quick and easy and painless to install. And if you have a, uh, a touchscreen monitor that works on a Raz Pi, like the uh, Raspberry Pi official seven inch touchscreen, what a wonderful box that creates. I have uh, been on the road several times in the last two weeks with this box, with all the problems solved, uh, and wow, just what a great audio streamer. So we did that as a project last week. It doesn't take long to set up. It's very easy. Uh, it's very easy. It's very easy to use once you get used to it. It's a little bit quirky and it's not, it, on the scale of one to 10 for intuitive, it's about an eight, but that was two missing pieces. You gotta do some hunting and digging. And I have uh, posted three questions to the Volumio org help forum in trying to work out a couple of these issues. They're very helpful over there and uh, got, them, got them all worked out within a day or two. Sometimes they didn't have the answer, but the answer they gave uh, led me down a path that gave me a solution. But what I did last week uh, is give you the answers to all the problems that I'd encountered as part of the presentation. So cool bananas. News, tricks, and techniques of the week. A reminder, not next week, not next Friday, but the following Friday is our one-year anniversary show. Same time, same channel, right here, 2 o'clock. And uh, I, I, I'm debating whether or not we're just going to take questions and do anniversary giveaways and things like that because we have so many to do and there's always so much to talk about. The project that I have in mind for it is a little time consuming, so I don't want to do that. But important part is the anniversary show. And of course, for you, the important part is giveaways of Raspberry Pis, right? So let me put up what you need to do to participate in those giveaways. We, are, we don't do it the way Mike does his contest. I'm not going to throw a question out and people post answers on the the YouTube chat because there's latency issues and timing issues and things that make people unhappy sometimes. So what I'm going to have you do is pre-register for a drawing. You're going to have to between now and midnight, August 5th, my time, Houston time, Central time, US. And all you got to do to register is send an email to this address, pi at totalsem.com. Got to get it by midnight, August 5th. And it has to have these four pieces of information in it. Your YouTube name, your actual name, first and last, your email address. I know it's in the, the email, but if you'd be kind enough to put it in the body, uh, it's a lot easier for me to copy and paste into the uh, spreadsheet that I'm using to generate the, the random list. And give me now your mailing or your shipping address. And so when we pick a winner, you won't have to contact Kathy or anything like that. We'll say Tullowit won. We won't actually say Tullowit won. He has no chance of winning. <laughs> but somebody like Tullowit uh, may win. And then, okay, we've already got all the information we need and we can start working on shipping. Because we're not shipping them from Total Seminars. We're going to drop ship what we can from Amazon. And if we can't drop ship to you, uh, these products, whatever they're going to be, certainly we can get you the electronic stuff from Total Seminars, but if we can't ship you a Raz Pi kit, we will find some other uh, equivalent value thing that we can send to you. Maybe it'll be uh, Amazon gift certificates or maybe it'll be something else, uh, but whatever, we're going to find something for you. Okay. So send me that pi at totalsem.com. I've got a, a good number of applicants so far, registered so far. And let me tell you then how this is gonna work. <laughs> okay, Scott, I, I will, I, I've been chewing on that, wondering if that question was gonna come up. <laughs> uh, let me tell you how the contest is gonna work. On show day at semi-random times during the show, we'll say, all right, it's time for a drawing. And I have a random number generator and all these uh, entries are on line numbers in a spreadsheet. So we'll use the random number generator and it picks number 48. So I'm going to go to line 48 and say, okay, line 48 is YouTube name best in the world. 
Best in the world, are you here? And you need to be present to win. You must respond to my call to you in the next minute or so. And if you do, you have won that raffle prize and we will get it out to you. And if that person doesn't answer in that minute, then the prize goes back in the hopper. Your name is eliminated. So you got to be here for the whole two hours or till you get your prize, one prize per person or per address. Uh, but we'll, we'll draw another number until we find a winner. So get your friends and neighbors and relatives to register as well, <laughs> especially if somebody's interested in Raz Pi, of course. Uh, and I saw from, uh, I think, Patricia Grace the other day uh, that she had uh, forwarded, copied, shared uh, my announcement on LinkedIn with her group. Appreciate that. And if anybody else uh, sees that on LinkedIn, please share. Uh, I will do another LinkedIn announcement uh, sometime between now and Monday, and then I'll do another one next week as well. And same for the Reddit forums on which I participate. We've got announcements on the uh, Raspberry Pi forums. Uh, please pass around these announcements and, and let's make it a, a real fun contest and, and a lot of fun show. Okay. So Scott posted, uh, back channeled me a question from uh, Andre. What is going on here? Oh, there it is. Okay. And Andre wants to know, how do I know if my registration was received? I, you know, the, the thing for me to do, the right thing for me to do is to do a reply. Uh, you know what? I'll do that. Um, I, I haven't replied to any of them. Uh, I, I think the short answer is uh, if you didn't see a bounce message, uh, it was received, but I will do a reply uh, on all of the registrations that I get and say, got it or something like that registration received. I'll make it some official sounding text and you'll know. But Andre, I do remember you were one of the first people uh, and I do have yours. So if you don't hear from me, know that I got yours. Let um, me finish up news, tricks and traps of the week. Not traps, techniques. Hey, uh, I've had this on my notes for a couple of weeks and I forgot to uh, tell you about it. This is... Uh, Kind of germane to when we did the open cv show maybe and if i you know what who knows i may have told you about it <laughs> registration confirmed see you on august 6th ah, i like that good text thanks scott <laughs> so we use open cv and some programs to recognize and make determinations on shapes and things like that finger positions and so forth uh, identify how many fingers are up, how many fingers are down, which fingers are up, things like that. Uh, that's the intelligence of OpenCV. Well, three companies got together and they created a kit, a machine learning kit. Uh, one of them is, are you ready? Microsoft. One of them is Adafruit or Adafruit. And then one, of, one or several of them are the people whose software that they've used. So I'll tell you what, I'll post this link uh, and you can do some research on it. It's, it's just fascinating. Uh, to, and some of the, the fact that Microsoft is working with Adafruit, Adafruit is fantastic. All right, so we're gonna call this AI Kit. All right, that's posted at current time, which is 2.43 or so. I went to uh, Micro Center yesterday to get a couple things that I wanted that were on sale. You won't be able to see this very well. Eh, hang on, I got stuff blocking my, I can't see myself very well. There we go. So it's a micro SD card. It costs 20 bucks and it's 256 gigs. And it's a flash drive. It costs a little over 20 bucks and it's 256 gigs. So I'm looking for projects that need a lot of space, but I don't want to hook up a, a an external USB hard drive or SSD for those. So that's going to be a ton of fun. Uh, while I was in there, I browsed. That's always bad for my budget, but they have these really cheap 720p 
uh, flimsy webcams. Uh, and I've seen them in there before. I wouldn't buy one for an enemy, <laughs> but because uh, they were like 35 bucks. And again, they're 30 frames, they're 720p. Eh. But apparently everybody feels the same way that I did. So they put them on sale for $3 a piece. And to my credit, I didn't buy 30. But, you know, I got enough for, I picked up a handful of them so they can go on various pies. And I'm very excited about doing a lot of camera and AI and machine learning stuff with them. I'm working on a project. I got a, a piece of, of equipment in the mail the other day uh, with a Pi Pico. I'm not going to do this with you as a project. I've decided that I will do a Pi Pico project with you, a nice simple one, uh, in the coming weeks. But I got one that uh, takes four pieces of equipment: the R Pi, a GPS receiver, a real-time clock add-on, battery-powered, and a, a very interesting display. And it turns into into a super accurate clock. That's not a big deal of a project. It's the way the the information is going to be displayed on this display. I'll, I'll finish this project up in a week or two, I hope. Uh, but no, nope, because I'm still waiting on uh, one other piece of equipment. But cool project up and coming. The, uh, the archive server is up. Got all my archive documents, including today's. Pi R square archive docs are available at https colon whack whack pi r square. I'm putting this in the YouTube chat feed. Dot zapto dot org. So if you want to see all the notes and graphics and steps that I used on today's project uh, without having to do pausing and taking notes here, that's a good place to go get that. Just go to the downloads link. Uh, it's, I think it's the first or second of the Euro links. And it's good stuff. Andrew Hutz is not here. I'm not going to plug his project. You got to be here, Andrew. I'll, I'll plug your blog. And I saw you posted on, uh, I'm talking to him like he's here on LinkedIn as a post. But uh, if you know Andrew Hutz or, or hang out over on uh, Discord with him, he's got a an ever-growing blog of interesting and fascinating topics. I feel like a nice guy. I'll put it on the feed. And I encourage you to check it out. I'm reading everything that he's posting. He's a really sharp guy. I'd like to do some work with him sometime. All right, I'm completed with uh, all my notes, uh, except for the project itself. And we still got 12, 12 minutes. It's not a long project. Uh, it's quick, it's fun, it's easy, and it's interesting. So let me see if what else has popped up here on the Q&A, and then we'll get on to projects. Reading questions, Stanley. Jason Helms, you have watched this show and Mike show so many thousands of times, if you can't sing this mantra with me, something's wrong. But Jason asks a question. Now, wait a minute. Let me go up a little bit and see. Oh, Scott posted the pi r square link too at uh, 233. Oh, I got to go way up. I missed a bunch of stuff. Okay, I'm, I'm picking it up at 231. Okay, yeah, Tolo will be there after the show today. He's a moderator there. 232, totally spaced. This is Friday. Okay, Jason shows up because he was zonked. <laughs> that happens. <laughs> I got the I got the Sandemus reference. <laughs> yeah, you haven't missed anything yet. I'll start the project here in the next five minutes or so. Uh, Kivos, I should use Raspberry Pi in the future. I just use VirtualBox because it's free. Nothing wrong with that. Completely support that. The problem with it, if there is a problem, is you can't do any of the electronic projects. We haven't done any in a long time. and uh, I have some in mind, but they're not real tightly tied to CompTIA, so I don't do much on them. Here at the house? Oh, yeah. Uh, remember that next time you mock me for oversleeping. <laughs> I was planning my birthday event, says Jason, at 2.34 for this evening. 
you know, how much planning does it take? Unscrew, pour in glass, nah, <laughs> hit it <laughs> straight from the neck. Uh. Reading questions. Yes, happy birthday, Jason. I knew you mentioned that you had it coming up. Wednesday Discord, you said you might make it. Yeah. <laughs> if he'd started his birthday early, he wouldn't have made it. Okay, Jason asks the question that you've, you've got to know Mike's mantra by now. Uh, would you suggest a person going for Net Plus or CCNA? Uh, so I'll give you the Mike answer, and it's my answer as well. The answer is, what are you going to do? So CCNA is a multi-part course now. It is half networking. Same stuff that you're going to get in Net Plus. It's half Cisco routers. You're going to learn iOS programming. And then the third half is a whole bunch of classes that they are certifications that they killed and rolled into CCNA. There's a, a lot of cloud stuff in there and a lot of other goodies. So if you envision that you are going to find a position where it's important that you know iOS and going to work on uh, Cisco routers, CCNA is a great approach. The historically good way to do it is you take Net Plus first. You do them both uh, because Net Plus gives you all the networking background that CCNA is going to require that you have. And then when you do CCNA, you just pick up the, the, the odds and ends that are kind of specific to uh, some of their proprietary networking stuff. It's the same stuff that we talk about in Net Plus, except they give it their own proprietary names. And then you focus on the iOS and the stuff that they've rolled in. Uh, if so, if you're not looking at a future that says I'm going to be programming Cisco routers, then there's no need for CCNA. Head straight for uh, just do Net Plus, and then pursue whatever specialty education. If you want to do pen testing or CyberSec or something like that. So CCNA is not a generic certification, it's a certification for people who want to and need to work on Cisco routers and need to learn networking. And a few other things that Cisco likes. Cisco and Jason, hope that helps. Fireballing. <laughs> I had a taste of that once from somebody. It's no, this is a no cake for his anniversary, just pie. Oh, that was so thin. That's what I get for reading comments before I read the names. I'm passing time, Mark 237. Thank you for groaning, Scott. Huh? That yeah, little bit wouldn't scare the fuzz off of me. <laughs> That's a good line. I may use that. Never here, but I have a place where I envision using that. Andre de Goyard is here. Hello, guys. I was on the phone with a friend. I dispute that. Not that you were on the phone, but that you have a friend. I'm kidding. So how do we know for our registration? We covered that ground. That was 238. Moving on. I thought Andre thought he had a good question. He was right. <laughs> good Lord. Never send pictures of money. In the next minute, what about latency? <laughs> yeah. You stream at 1400. Yeah, I know you don't get to see it until 2100. So yeah, you, your, your registration is going to be seven hours late. Sorry, it's just the way it goes. goes. Debate. <laughs> I'm reading a total question. I, I've, I've trying to learn my lesson not to read them out loud until I've pre read them. Oh my gosh. You did not actually research the history of Mike contest winners. There is no way. You have way too little time because of all your scanning efforts. <laughs> so the first time I won, Mike made me pass. He was convinced I'd already won too many times. I remember that. Uh, it's funny when I went back and, and started indexing all these things from the beginning, uh, the names and the, the activities that were happening in those early days. Uh, they just real trip down memory lane. Enjoyed that. <laughs> right. Well, so we're even. You paid 350. 
I paid three fifty, give or take. It was about three bucks, two ninety six US. Passing two forty eight. Links have been copied and posted to Discord channel. Thank you, Andre. Yeah, I did that. I did. My third half was on purpose because <laughs> I can't count. <laughs> that fraction thing totally threw me in sixth grade. Uh, Andre David Rush, I have lots of friends. You'd be surprised about how much money I have to spend to keep them right. Long as I'm buying the rounds, I got friends like crazy. I was getting my AMA contest. I totally you know. <laughs> I, just, yeah, I knew you didn't have enough time to do that, but I would not put it past some people who come here on occasion or in full time. All right, I'm caught up on that. So let's talk turkey with five minutes to go. So I was racking my brain Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. What project, what show am I going to do for drama? Uh, and just the stuff that was out there just wasn't going to work for the show. It's too time consuming. I don't want to, I hate doing multi-part shows. There are some I see in the future that I think are going to be great. We're going to have to do them, but ugh. I like the idea of self-contained. And, you know, I read the news, you know, all the, the computer news and Linux news and Raspberry Pi news and CompTIA news every day. And usually sometime in a couple of days, something, oh, wow, that would be great to talk about. In fact, that just happened for next week's show. I'll tell you about uh, in a little bit. But uh, man, I just couldn't come up with it. And then I was playing with a tool that I play with all the time. And you've seen it briefly on here, what, five, six months ago. Uh, and it dawned on me, hey, wait a minute, we could take a, a closer gander at that thing. So the title of today's show, if it has a title, is Cool Tools for Raspberry Pi. And the cool tools are all going to come from the same application, it's an application called, excuse me, hiccup time. All come from an application called Pi Apps, Pi Dash Apps. Pi Apps is an attempt, it's not the only attempt out there, it's certainly not the first attempt, but it's an attempt to create something that's kind of like uh, a store. Everything in it's free. Uh, and when I say store, I'm talking about uh, a repository of installable apps for a particular operating system, right? So Google has their Play Store and Apple has their, I think it's called the Apple Store. Microsoft has their Microsoft Store, their Windows Store, whatever that's called. And so this is something some folks have tried to do uh, to create a Raspberry Pi store. Thank you. Uh, time 357. Scott just posted a link to Pi Apps, and I'm gonna. I have one as well. Or no, I, uh, he posted the one that I posted uh, for him to do. So that'll be cool. So you can check that out. So what what's going on here is this is not a site that holds a repository. What happens is uh, the developers of the Pi Apps program cast about looking for developers of applications. Hey, Joe developer out there, um, we see you have an application that uh, I, makes your screen turn pretty colors at random. And it's called pretty color screen. And it, it, it's in the repository, we can see that, but we try to install it and you have to sudo apt install this and then sudo apt install that and then copy this from here to there. And you know it's got all these steps in there. Wouldn't it be cool if you could build a script that would do all of those things and we will make it and therefore your product available at our Pi Apps utility. So that's what's in Pi Apps. When you see something that says install SuperCAD, uh, SuperCAD doesn't exist anywhere, but it's here most likely because it was painful to install manually without doing a whole bunch of steps. Uh, and there's also some other things in there. Uh, sometimes people put uh, a script in there for their product because their product is in a repository, but because of something that's changed in the operating system, uh, the one in the repository doesn't work anymore. It takes a while 
to get those things updated and upgraded. So either as a stopgap or to heck with it, uh, let's get it in Pi apps. So that's what Pi apps is and does. Now I spent a lot of time uh, in the last six or seven months playing with Pi apps. And I spent a really lot of time in the last couple of nights playing with it. And I'm gonna rate it as about a seven. Most of the stuff, all of it's designed to be single click. That's really cool. You pick a product, it's got a descriptor on it. You click it and hit info and it's got more information on it. That's kind of cool. And you say, you know, I want to do install this or maybe go off and do some individual research before you do. When you finally make that decision to install it, all you have to do is one click on the utility and then one click on the install button and it happens. And some things happen in a minute or two and some things take hours. And those are the great ones in Pi apps because you know if they take a long time, it's gonna be stuff that you would have had to do a lot of typing and a lot of research on tutorials. And so that's really good. But about three times out of 10, I was either dissatisfied with the install, it was problematic, it didn't work at all. What it installed was different than what seemed to be described. Eh whatever. And then uh, again, uh, about three times out of 10, uh, these all have uninstall scripts. So again, it's a single click job. I don't want that thing anymore. It was fine, but I just don't want it or I don't want it because I don't like it. Uh, and so again, you click the utility in Pi apps and you click the uninstall button and it runs a script and uninstalls. I found more than my fair share of installed programs that would not uninstall uh, and I had to find workarounds and there's not much out there. This is uh, stuff that you got to figure out how to uninstall yourself. And I will give you this. Uh, the one thing that I learned that's very consistent is if there is a corollary product in a repository, uh, let's say we just used Pi apps and installed super colors and I tried to uninstall it and it said fail to uninstall. Well, if super, seller, super colors exist in a repository, I'll just go do an install on it. Pseudo apt install super colors comes from the repository. It installs over the one that's in, that was installed by Pi apps. And then I can do a pseudo apt uninstall or pseudo apt remove super colors and everything goes away. So it's an okay product and it has some interesting and useful things. So I wanna show you how to install it. And then we're going to, uh, install and check out a couple of the uh, the apps and, and utilities that are there. And I got to tell you, that, I mean, some of the scripts here are really complex and work really well. Uh, but they may be they may involve installing a lot of heavy software, including emulators and shims like Box eighty six and Wine. Uh, and that's great that they do this, especially when they work. Uh, VNC has worked on everything that I've tried to do with this. So you can do this totally headless on your pie. That's kind of nice. Uh, okay, that was that, that was that, that was that. So as far as objectives go, there's no direct corollary objectives in any of the, the trifecta CompTIA certifications that we mess with. But some of the apps that we're going to play do have uh, peripheral contact with some of those things like file transfer utilities and things like that. Oh, and yeah, I, I, these were good examples. Uh, there are a lot of CAD packages in there. Some of them are specific to electronics. Some of them are uh, designed to make stuff for your 3D printer. Some of them are generic uh, CAD. Uh, and so how I think that touches on CompTIA is in A+, we have to know what the criteria are and the most important components of installing a CAD or building a CAD machine. And the same is true here. Uh, if you're looking at your uh, Raspberry Pi Zero with its 512 megs of RAM, and you're thinking about using Pi apps to install a CAD program, think again. CAD needs a heavy duty CPU, number one, and number two, to a slightly lesser degree, a lot of RAM. So if I'm going to install a CAD program and I'm going to use Pi apps to do it, I want to do it on at least a Pi 4 with two gigs of RAM and maybe something with four gigs. Uh, same is true for virtual machines. So it's good to know those criteria from A plus 
to make that decision. Should I install it on this model Pi or would it be better on that model Pi? So what do you need for our project today? I'm doing it on a 3B plus. It's that machine that we've been running in here for the last year. And it just works great doing this thing. Uh, again, if you're going to do heavy duty stuff, install it on a four with more RAM, uh, RAM and faster processor. And if you're doing really heavy duty stuff, install it on a, a four gig or an eight gig Raspi that's overclocked with a good cooling solution. You all know that I like Ice Tower for my cooling solution these days. Um, you can do it with a small card, 16 gigabit. I think I wouldn't play in this arena with less than a 32 gig card. You can install it on an existing installation of Raspberry Pi OS or works fine on an old installation that you're keeping up to date. That's what I'm doing on the, the machine that we're using here today. And of course you need a network connection. The case comes in pretty handy. So to install Pi apps itself is a one step command. There is a little tutorial, Scott posted the link to that. Let's see, I slid up to, I slid away from it. Bot spot, yeah, over at, uh, at time mark 257. So I'm not gonna post that up. Yeah, yes, I will. I'm gonna post up a, uh, a PDF right quick and show you two things on there. You have what you need, but here's a neat way to do it. So this is the link that Scott posted that has a, for lack of a better term, a tutorial. Uh, and they show you three things in there, how to install it, how to use it, how to uninstall it. And this is the instructions on how to install it. And I'll post that in the uh, YouTube chat feed in just a second. Or again, you can get it from my download archive documents. Uh, Note that there is a dash immediately before and after this Q0. And there's a space before the dash here after wget and before the HTTPS. All right, let me post that wget line because I'm not going to demonstrate that for you. It's really quick. It's less than two minutes. But I've already got it installed and I just didn't want to risk uninstalling that with all the other things that were fighting me so hard last night. You go to this document. There's my wget line. So you'd open up a terminal session and put in the command that I'm just about to type into the YouTube chat. I'm not gonna type it, I'm gonna copy and paste it. So we'll call this install pi apps. And you can get this line also from that uh, link that Scott posted. Okay, cool. That showed up. All right, so let me get connected to a host that's got Pi apps in it. Do this, connect. Oh, heck, let's close that. Okay, now you can see it. Share this. Okay, so what you do is log into your Pi, connect to it. You would run this wget command. Whoops, that's a different one. I remembered something I did last time. You get the idea. And in a couple seconds, it'll be done. And you will not see what you see on my machine right now. It will appear here in the Raspberry Pi accessories menu, Pi apps. To get it on your desktop, if you want, you can just click it here and it'll launch. But if you right click over here and you say add to desktop, it will appear here. And there's something funny about this. When I run it from here, if I double click it from here, it won't launch, it brings up this menu it says, hey, you want to run this thing? Yeah, how do you want to run it? In the terminal, you want to execute it? Do you want to open the properties of it? So I'll execute it. Now, Pi Apps, once it's installed, automatically updates regularly. 
It could be as frequently as every day or every couple of days. And let me show you what that's gonna look like because one of the things I think that's really unfortunate about it is there is no menu option here to say, check for updates. So let me quit out of this share. I took a couple of screenshots of what happens when the update occurs. We'll zoom this up a little bit. So when it's detected that it needs an update, it posts this little guy in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. Now, if you close this, you won't get the updates. So what you do is you click on the details menu and you'll get the following. So this shows you what's been updated and then you have a choice of updating any or all of them, check mark them, uncheck mark them, click update now, click later if you wanna do it later. And then the screenshot that I didn't get in time is a terminal screen opens up and it runs an update script in there. And at the end of the update script, it will say something like closing window in 10 seconds or closing window in 30 seconds, just wait it out and you're in biz. All right, now let's go share this again. Shrink you, click this. Share Pi Apps. And there we go. Okay, so here's Pi Apps installed. Move to the desktop. I've double clicked it. I said execute it. And you can see there's a whole bunch of categories here. All apps conglomerates everything from all here. So if there's a particular app you're looking for and you don't know where it is, all apps is a good way to go. You have to double click. And it finds all of them. You can scroll down. If you hover over it, you get a simple little uh, piece of information about it, a summary. If you single uh, click it and then go down here to the eye, you get a lot more information about it. Sometimes it's helpful, sometimes it's not. You can install from here or you can install any of these from just by single clicking it and clicking the install button. And I'll take you to one that I've got installed and show you what happens if you want to uninstall. I think I have some installed. Maybe I cleaned them all out yesterday. So I'm double clicking tools. Maybe I'm double clicking tools. There we go. And I've got a handful of these that I want to show you in particular. Here's one that failed during the install process. And it didn't actually fail. Uh, I was installing it and it got to a menu that I looked at it and said, I don't want to continue. So it doesn't have the X for uninstalled here. It has this exclamation point that says corrupted. It wasn't really corrupted, but that came up when I declined the install. And then if it has no X on it, it's just a, a blank screen or a blank suitcase here, whatever it is, then that means it's installed. Do a quick tour of all of these. So tools, uh, let's stick around tools here for a minute. We're gonna install Commander today. That's a really kind of slick program. I'll talk about that is this HTTPS file server, what's going on with it and uh, why I didn't do it. Power Tools is cool. You can edit your Raspi image, uh, which means you take another image that you've burned, uh, but haven't used yet. And uh, it's on a, a micro SD card. You put it into a micro SD reader that's plugged into your uh, Pi here and then you can do some editing on the image. It's kind of slick. Time shifting. Can hear you. I just rebooted this, there we go. It's like a system restore. That's an awesome little utility. Snap drop we're gonna to do today. I'll describe that to you later. All right, you get the idea. Oh, Veracrypt, if you wanna encrypt your entire storage drive, your micro SD, your uh, USB flash drive, SSD, hard drive, 
you can use Veracrypt. Veracrypt is available on all flavors of Linux. And I think it even runs on Windows. A lot of these are in the repository. This one's not. And I started working on it last night and it got complicated, but this is a way to mirror your screens over a USB connection or a Wi-Fi connection to your Android phone. Doesn't work on Apple phones. And why should it? Nobody uses Apple phones, right? All right, so that's tools. Multimedia. Not much stuff in here. Bongo cam is just a little uh, thing that uh, puts a filter over your face when you're doing video. Chromium with Widevine. This is no longer necessary because there's official support for Wide, uh, yeah, Widevine now in Raspberry Pi. Here's a private YouTube player, OBS Studio, which I'm going to sooner or later switch to instead of using uh, Zoom. Uh, Sonic Pi is a program that used to be part of Raspberry Pi OS back when it was Raspbian. And it's a uh, simple music creation programming utility. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I had planned a long time ago on doing an episode and then they pulled it, but you can still install it. Uh, this is an audio player. Uh, if, <laughs> if anybody's old enough in here to remember Winamp, somebody has basically ported it over uh, and lets it run on Raspberry Pi. It does uh, run in a virtual machine and the uh, Windows emulator. And here's another YouTube search engine. So that's kind of a cool thing in multimedia. Internet, these are internet oriented tools. Mike's favorite, Angry IP Scanner. I think I've got that on my list to install. That's a lot of fun. The Discord app is recreated in here. LokiNet looks really interesting, but I need some more time with that thing. You can have this thing check your email. It'll do notifications for you. Lots of browsers in here, lots of different browsers, Tor browsers and Puffin and Pale and a minimal browser, high profile or high privacy. This one I haven't run yet. I've read the instructions on it yet, but I just didn't have time. Run websites as if they were apps. I don't know what that means, but I find it fascinating. Uh, WhatsApp, uh, WeChat, if you're in contact with uh, folks who chat in China. I'm serious about that. Uh, the Zoom install, we've installed this and it works great. Use it on an overclocked Pi 4. There's games in here. A lot of them run on emulators and shims and things like that. There's a, there's a good Minecraft server in the repository. I haven't played with this modded one, but I gather the mods include things like survival mode and multiplayer and so forth. The old descents in here. There's some old 8-bit ones in here. I've run this Astro Menace. That was kind of fun. Hi, Candy changes skins, emojis. We're gonna do Conky. Uh, and that's one of the ones that's got a problem with it. So we'll do it last. It, it does not want to uninstall. Maybe we're not doing Conky. Maybe I said, no, I'll check my notes. Uh, you can change the theme. So it looks like Mac OS. <laughs> and there's Windows screensavers here. Change the theme to a Windows theme. Ugh. I like Raspberry Pi. And then the last thing in here are editors. And there's about three kinds of editors. Half of them are uh, IDEs, development environments for programming. Half of them are text editors. Uh, and the third half are CAD programs. And I guess there's a fourth half with a couple of others. Notepad++, really useful and powerful semi-IDE, semi-text editor. All right, there's goodies in there. So let's do a couple. How are we doing here? It's only 20 after, good. We can get all these done in right quick order. Check on my nose, what am I doing first here? We did how to install, how to uninstall. Once installed, it, uh, everything, up, uh, everything auto updates regularly. Okay, we'll do Commander Pi first. This is about a two minute install. And that's in, why did I say desktop? Commander Pi, oh, it's tools. 
So we double click on tools. We go to commander, we'll highlight it, see what it is, is it's an easy GUI system management utility. See if they give me any more information. I single clicked it, I hit the I here. Using Commander Pi, you can change your overclock settings, your bootloader settings. Yeah, okay, I like that thing. And again, I can install it from here or from here. So we'll do this one this time. Oops, I hit I, not, <laughs> sorry, let's try that again. Commander Pi install. And when I say two minutes, I include the time that it takes to close the window when it's done. So the first thing it does, and not all programs do this. In fact, most of them don't. Uh, it says it's got to do the uh, apt, the, the program getter locks and unlocks. And it runs a, a pseudo apt update, which you should be doing anytime before you ever install anything in here. But fortunately, the update is quick because I did run it 47 times last night for all the changes that I was trying to make. Good Lord. I don't know what this dummy deb is. Um, oh, I do know what a dummy deb is. Uh, it's creating an artificial repository, putting the package in there. Hey, we're done. And then it installs from there. All packages were installed successfully, doing a clone. So now it's actually running the installation script. Tkinter is a program, just as an FYI, that's used to make graphical user interfaces. You can run Tkinter and make front end GUIs for Python programs and C++ programs and many, many others. Okay, the, inst the installation is complete. The window will close in 30 seconds. I can force it. You can do control C and force this, but I'm always terrified that something's going on there that I would interrupt. So I patiently await the closing of the window. Now, sometimes when Pi Apps installs a program. It does it by placing it here in the Raspberry Pi application icon menu. Uh, and on rare occasion, it'll put it right here on the desktop like Commander does. So, okay, we got to double click it as always. Let's shrink this thing, get it out of the way. We'll execute it. And it goes buzz, buzz, buzz. Here's a summary of what's going on real time. This is a nice little piece of info kind of like a widget about what's going on on all kinds of things in your computer. And then with the advanced tools, we can go in and here's where we would overclock. Here's where we would make changes to the bootloader. We can change IP addresses, more overclocking stuff here. You get the idea. I'm not going to do all that. Uh, and this one doesn't auto update. So you have to do a manual update now and again. I'm going to uninstall this one just to show you the uninstall process. The other ones will leave installed and keep moving on. Sometimes they take about as long as each other. What if I find there's Commander Pi. So I click it, I uninstall. And notice it doesn't give you an are you sure. When you say install or when you say uninstall, you have made your decision. <laughs> it's going to happen. So again, this is just a script that's running. Somebody wrote, fail to uninstall Commander Pi. Okay. I'll control C that one. And let's try something real quick. Sudo, I don't know if Commander Pi exists in the repository. It uninstalled fine last night. So this is a surprise for me. Sudo apt uninstall, uh, remove Commander Pi. <laughs> nope, I don't know what you're talking about. All right, well, I'll fix that later. It's not a high critical thing. Exit this. Notes. Next thing to install. To remove uninstall and CLI. Oh, okay. I did run this last night. Let me show you this. So this is one of the ones I had to research. To remove, run, uninstall from apps, it fails. You got to do the, the failure first. So we go to the home folder. This is why it only gets a rating of seven from me. This thing opens in the home folder. 
we get rid of everything in a commander pi folder. Oh, run, idiot. Okay, that's done. And now we're going to run the uninstaller again on here. And uninstalled Commander Pi successfully. So somebody bungled the script a little bit. And if they had just included in their script to delete the contents of uh, a directory, a folder called Commander Pi, the script would work fine. And if I cared enough, I'd write the author and say, hey, here's what's going on. But I don't care that much. Notes, 25 after, good, we're fine. There is one that I didn't do. I tried it last night and it looks really, really cool. Uh, but it failed, it didn't fail. I declined. It's an HTTPS file server. So what it does is it creates a little VM uh, and runs the Windows Box 86. And then it creates a, an FTP service and a web service in that VM. And then you can access that program and any file here on the system from any browser. You can even open it up with port forwarding and get files to and from, from any browser, any computer in the world. But when you go to install this thing, it says, oh, wait a minute, you're running a 32-bit version of an operating system on here. Uh, and that means we got to make some changes. We're going to have to recompile your kernel. It's set up in what they call 2G, 2G mode, and it needs to be set up in 3G, 1G mode. I'd, I'll teach you a class on that someday. It'll take me 20 minutes to explain it. Uh, and I didn't want to recompile my kernel. Everything is working great here. Uh, I'll do that sometime. Uh, but it's really cool. I have the same thing on my Android phone. I have a, uh, an app here called Wi-Fi Transfer Pro. Pro is a paid version. But I launch it. And then all I have to do is from any computer that can access this thing, a local one or uh, one over a WAN, if I set up port forwarding, I can access anything on here with a web browser and upload, download, delete, to a lesser degree, edit. And so great, great program. Great, great concept of a program. But I didn't want to recompile my kernel, so. Snapdrop. Okay, Apple people. This is a program in tools. So I think we're in tools, yeah. That was, let's say, use the word inspired by AirDrop. There's SnapDrop. So we'll install this. It's quick, painless, about a two minute install. I'd say I made some notes on how long each of these installs took. Minute 45, and again, I think I included the window close screen process in there. While that's going on, I'm gonna open up a web browser on, I could open on my Android phone, uh, but I'll open up on one where you can see it. How are we doing here? Okay, that's happening. I'm gonna leave you to watch that while I go do this. Oh, geez. Almost had a panic there. Okay, it's installed. The window's gonna close in 30 seconds. While we're waiting for that to happen, I'm gonna take you over here to my web browser and show you just the coolest thing about it. Share. We don't have to port forward on this. I can get out over the web, though it works best local. We're gonna to go to a website that's a real world website. It's not this computer. We're gonna to go to snapdrop.net. You can see I've been there because I tested this. Okay, so I'm plum rat on this thing. Open Snapdrop on other devices to send files. So I gotta go launch it over on the other program. It was over on the Raspberry Pi icon. I'll show you when we get back to this thing. Okay, so it's called Green Kangaroo.
My other machine is called Plum Rat. Sorry, I've lost track of my shares here. I gotta go, go find where I'm at. Okay, I'm in the browser over here, this browser page. So there's Green Kangaroo and tap to send files or long tap to send message. So I'll click on Green Kangaroo, files on my computer turn up. I pick one here, open it, and you can pick multiples. And okay, it's complete. Now I'll take you back and share you back on the pie. And very much like AirDrop, come here you, let's share. There it is, it's arrived at the SnapDrop location and whoever's running the pie can save it or ignore it, we'll save it. That's the stage I did last Sunday. So cool, I'm done with the program. Just exit out of it with the closed window here. You can put it to sleep, you can get some info on it. Switch dark mode and light mode, not putting it to sleep. Yeah, because dark mode is what came up on the, uh, the other computer when you go to snapdrop.com. All right, close that up. And now it's not running anymore. If you want to run it again, go to the Raspberry Pi apps icon, internet, and there's SnapDrop. Slick, huh? 31, just a couple more to show you. What I want you to do is get used to the idea here. Oh yeah, this is fun. I, I hope I uninstalled this. Uh, for To my mind, there are three IP scanner utilities out there uh, from very simple to very powerful. Very powerful, we have Nmap. Less powerful, we've got uh, the one I always use, advanced IP scanner, and then a little less powerful than that, but very efficient is Mike's favorite angry IP scanner. I stumbled on advanced IP scanner one day when I was looking for angry and hey, this looks like angry and I was wrong, it wasn't. All right, so here it is. We'll go to internet, double click. There's the angry IP scanner. Let's install it. It's a quick install, under two minutes. Um, oh, you know, I didn't write the time on that, but oh no, three minutes. It was takes about three minutes to install. We'll do a scan and a report, and the uninstall is about a minute and a half. The cool thing about Angry IP Scanner is it looks and acts very close to the Angry IP Scanner that's used in Windows. There are uh, a little bit of differences in the user interface and the graphical user interface, it is graphical, uh, but nothing significant, nothing you couldn't figure out. The thing that surprised me is that there was a difference because it's the same core code. Maybe there was something T. Kinter couldn't do with this that was necessary. Let's see, we got two more after this. Oh yeah, we're not doing conky. <laughs> Conky kicked my butt getting rid of it last night. How are we doing here? So there's that dummy Deb again. It's making an artificial repository. It's going to copy its installation package into that artificial repository. And then it's going to run kind of an internal pseudo apt install from that local repository. All packages have successfully been copied into the fake repo. So now he's running the equivalent of a sudo apt get install angry. And then it's going to do whatever else the script calls for, do some configuring, copy stuff into folders, delete unnecessary stuff from folders. It's a full install. Uh, and apt get doesn't always do that stuff. I could sing. <laughs> I shouldn't. All right. Okay, there we go. Um, I'll take a chance and close this now. Control C, internet, there's angry. Pyaps is still running, so let's shrink it and get it out of the way.
Come up, come up, wherever you are. There we go. So let's say I want to scan my network uh, for all the hosts from 192.168.1.1 through 192.168.1.254. I'm not going to do a whole class here. I'm running it on a computer whose name is PyBand Test. Uh, and let's make it a stock. That's a class C address. So we'll use a WAC24 mask and start it. And it goes buzz, 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 grind, grind, grind. It's scanning them all. You can set the maximum number of simultaneous threads this will do. Now, this is only a four thread machine. It's got four cores with one thread per core. But there we go. It's finished it. Took 15 seconds to scan that whole range. It found 30 living hosts right now. 13 of them had ports that were commonly open. And this is the same report and same look that you get when you run this from the Windows machine. So there's my next cloud machine. There's a machine that it couldn't determine the name. Drama.local. <laughs> you get the idea. And this thing uninstalls just fine the same way. I'm not going to uninstall it. I'll do that later when you're not watching because we want to get on and do other things. And there's nothing wrong with leaving it installed. Notes. Uh, games. So there's no game that I wanted to install here with you. Uh, just be aware that some of them uh, especially if you recognize them from old days, something like Doom or Descent, uh, that's going to install a whole bunch of stuff, uh, take a whole bunch of memory because it's going to put a virtual machine in it, and it's going to probably put uh, wine in it if it was designed to run on old Windows. So I wouldn't try those on a, a Pi Zero, and I probably wouldn't try them on a Pi 3. I'd go straight for a 2 gig or bigger Pi 4. There's a program in here called Conky. And Conky is another kind of widget statusy type thing. Uh, it installs fine. The way it runs is abysmal and it does not uninstall at all with that utility. That was the one where I had to manually install Conky from the repository and then uninstall it from the repository. And that got rid of the, the bad installation from Pi apps. Uh, it's an interesting little utility, a bit of a learning curve, but and so it, it very much looks like a, a performance monitoring widget uh, back in the Windows 7 and Vista days, but just not going to do it. Uh, there's another product here. Let's bring those up so you can at least see them. These are both in the eye candy area. It's a strange place for them to be. Okay, so there's Conky. And there's Conky rings. Conky displays all of the, the stats about your computer using one format. Conky rings is the same program, but it displays them kind of like uh, dashboard console uh, instruments on a, a car or a plane or something like that. And if you have one installed, you can't install the other. Last element for notes. Conky, conky rings. Oh, that was it. Okay. And then the other thing, the, the final thing was the, the last of the cool characters in here, the editors. Uh, I have played with a lot of the editors in here uh, and found them almost all successful as far as installs and uninstall goes. Some of them, I didn't find them particularly useful or easy to learn, uh, but if you play with the Arduino, it's kind of like the precursor of the Raspberry Pi Pico. You have to get programs into it. And there are programming languages that it understands. This is a development environment, an IDE, that lets you develop and put code into your Arduino. I don't know, CD guy. I had to turn that right side up to put it away. <laughs> This is a good vector graphics generation program. Your normal vector graphics generator program is Adobe, not Photoshop, the other one, uh, not images. Somebody type it in. Uh, but this one's not bad for open source. Cura is used to make uh, 3D models 
and slicers for 3D printers. And so it recreates the program in such a way that the printer knows how to lay out this layer, how thick this layer is, and then it moves up to the next layer and so forth. Uh, and there's, there's some other pieces like that, individual pieces here. Eagle CAD, FreeCAD, seven drawing. This is kind of a hand-drawn PNG editor. So it's kind of like Photoshop, not as powerful. Lots of IDEs in here, development environments. Uh, I was gonna put this in last night and it just got too late with all the troubleshooting and everything. So that looks really interesting. I know everybody, a lot of people still love Legos and you can do Lego CAD design here, which is pretty darn cool. You wanna create printed circuit boards. Libre PCB, it's a very good program. It's very popular. Uh, solid CAD modeling. I've run that program in here very frequently. There's a Java IDE. Here's another slicer program for Prusa printer, printers. Prusa is a style uh, of printing engine for 3D printers. There's other engine arms. PyCharm, probably one of the most popular IDEs for Python in existence. So you can install that from here. You can also install it from the repository. Scratch has been removed from Raspberry Pi OS. It's a programming language for kids and people who've never programmed and don't want to learn to type. It's a drag and drop block type program. Uh, it's very cool. I use uh, another little single board computer uh, that doesn't mandate Scratch, but it's really cool to program with. Turbo Warp. It's, it's another version of Scratch. Uh, Visual Studio. Okay, if you're playing in VS Code, there's a good IDE here for it. It's the Microsoft one. Uh, it's the Microsoft one. It's the free source version of that. And there's another Visual Studio code that is private. It doesn't use, doesn't tell Microsoft what you're doing. So. Hey, that's it, kids. As far as, so we're calling this Cool Tools for Raspberry Pi accessible through Pi apps. Again, a lot of this stuff could be done manually. It's not hypercritical, but it's cool. And I like the fact that they're constantly updating this all the time and they're throwing in new programs now and again. I think their biggest flaw is developers who've put it on there, some developers do not keep up with the changes of the operating systems on which these are being installed. And so the uninstallers don't work. And sometimes the, the programs themselves, the things that get installed don't auto update and they're, they're not manually updating those scripts. All right, so let's go see what's going on here. We got 20 minutes left. It was a good show as far as timing goes. And I'm picking up questions at 3.07, which is an interconversation at yeah. Is there somebody here called yeah? <laughs> Zach is here, or at least was, he's probably gone by now. But if you're still here, Zach, good to see you, buddy. Hope the gig is working out well. I have a few old phones that still work, so it could be interesting. Reading questions, passing 315. I didn't send you to the principal's office, Jason. <laughs> the, the hail, hail, the gang's all here. We got Patricia, Zach, Tullowit, Jason, you're an old guy now. Uh, Andre, of course. It's kind of like a mini Discord meeting here, isn't it? A lot of people are saying hi to Zach and others. Passing 318. I'm going to read slow. I'm going to run out of time here. <laughs> time out. There's not that much left. Oh, yeah. I got to talk about next week's show. Today's first day for temperature isn't in the 30s. Nice. Yeah, I hope you get some cool weather. And Andre, I hope you guys are drying out. Send some of that water to Germany. I heard they're a little light on water. I shouldn't say that. Thoughts and prayers going out to the folks in Germany. Uh, and where else did I see? I was reading somebody else who got flooded today and I lost track. Oh, China. 
All right. Very handy if you put a small screen on a Pi case and plug it into somebody else's network. <laughs> yeah, but you got to install uh, SnapDrop on theirs. Illustrator, thank you, Kyle. Exactly right. So Adobe Illustrator makes vector graphics. Adobe Photoshop makes raster graphics. I just downloaded PyCharm on Kali to practice Python 3, says Zach. Very cool. Yeah, PyCharm is, is great. I had a, an IDE that I wanted my kid to do uh, so we could compare notes uh, for the, the Python class that I'm doing. I've, I've been using Thani. I don't know if it's pronounced Tawny or Thani. And he said, no, I'm a college guy. We use PyCharm. He said it may be a little bit more friendly, but. I was definitely left to understand that I'm using a childish IDE by comparison. Uh, I, I've abandoned uh, 343 Zach. Uh, I've abandoned the uh, the concert shirt. I've run through all the ones that I have. There are about a dozen that I need to get for concerts that I've been to and haven't uh, gotten shirts for them. We will do that. Concert season is uh, about ready to get back in full swing here. I've got four concerts slated for the summer, some of them uh, that I've seen before and I just like them enough to go see them again. A couple of them I haven't seen live before. So excited about that. Okay, great question, Tolowit 344. Tolowit says, can you use a screen from an old smartphone as a screen for a Pi? The answer used to be no, but that's changed. What's happening is, what happens is, when you have an LED or an LCD screen, it has a circuit board called a driver. Now, there's a driver, of course, there are driver software, but there are driver hardware. And the driver hardware knows about uh, all of the positions of all the pixels in here and all of their capabilities, uh, how bright, how many colors. So usually it's three or four colors and each color on a pixel uh, it has 255 levels of, excuse me, brightness gradient. And they are making drivers for lots of LCD screens, the ones that are coming off tablets, ones that come off laptops, some that come off phones and tablets that are supported on the Raspi. So the answer to that is not necessarily a yes, it's a maybe. You got to come up with the make model and then start your search on eBay because that's where a lot of it's being sold. So yes, it's possible. I went, uh, I, I like the idea. I have not done it personally. I've certainly watched a lot of YouTube videos. Uh, I have no doubt that I could do it. And it doesn't take a tremendous amount of electronics understanding. You're going to need some tools. You shouldn't have to do any soldering. It's all done with, uh, DuPont jumper cables. Sometimes you got to do a little bit of soldering uh, to get the, but there's usually holes already to solder headers into. So it's a cool thing. I, I do tend to like though, uh, things like the official Raspberry Pi seven inch screen and they've got a 10 inch screen and WaveShare makes tons of little touch screens of different sizes and resolutions that are designed and ready to go into the display connector port on a Raz Pi. Yeah, uh, this is the camera input port. And back here is the, I think it's called the CSI display port. And that saves a lot of trouble with drivers, but yeah, can be done. Dave went spicy today, Zach. I did. You don't find, I bet you don't find a ton of jalapenos in Northern England but probably some. <laughs> Dave, stop doing concert shirts. To, no, it wasn't to end the puns. It was just because I've been through the rotation plenty of times. And that's why I've got new things going in rotation like this stuff. And the world changes over time. Uh, concerts that I'm doing this year, I am doing Steely Dan, Steve Winwood, Michael McDonald, Doobie Brothers presently on the schedule. I've got some other ones that I'm pursuing, but those are the ones you guys would know. All right, I have caught up on questiones. 
I think Alice is planning on taking her test in really short order. Somebody let me know. And uh, I'm looking forward to her killing it this time because she was so close last time. And then seeing her again on AMA. She did pop up the other day on mics. So that would be good to see her again here. Uh, let me talk a little bit about next week's show. I wasn't going to do a show next week. I was going to do a show, but I wasn't going to do a feature. And it's still eh, up in the air. But I, I found it today and I, I checked out some of these tutorials and it looks quick and painless. So here's the deal. Um, later this, later next week, uh, I got a road trip. I uh, got to go back and, and see some family and do some things back in the, the U.S. Midwest. And I will be on the road on Friday. I, I will have completed driving and I'll be someplace where I can uh, do the show, either a hotel or the in-laws place or something like that. And what I was tentatively planning on doing was just a Q&A, probably an hour or so when it dries up, uh, close it down. But then I found this project. Uh, I only have to take one pie and the basics that go with that. And it's a text to speech converter. And so I think I'm gonna do that. Uh, the cool thing that I'm looking at it is it will work straight from the command line. It's a program called eSpeak. Check it out for yourself. You can probably have it done and running uh, tonight and you don't even have to bother to watch the show, but I'll show you three different ways to do it. And that's the cool thing. Uh, so we install eSpeak and then you can run it from straight from the command line. It's command followed by text or uh, yeah, command followed by text. Basically there's a couple switches and you just type in English text or it doesn't have to be English. It's very intelligent. It's got a lot of other language support in there. And I think that's one of the really cool things about it. If you, the default uh, accent is English. So if I say, e-speak, hello world, you're gonna hear something like, hello world, though it probably won't sound as nasal as I do. Uh, how about you say, uh, speak, bonjour tout le monde, uh, it, when you type that in. Well, it'll say in English accent, bonjour to le monde, but you can change the accent uh, and make it, so you say something, speak, I think it's minus FRF or minus minus FRF, and that will make it apply a French accent to whatever text it's reading. That's just cool as it all get out. <laughs> so we, we can say, hello world, or you put French text in and uh, make it say, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, so that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to include it into Python code. So this is kind of and the other code as well. So that's kind of cool. You can create a program and instead of having it respond to you in a textual way or in a graphical way, it'll talk to you out your speaker and give you answers. You program, you did it exactly correct. Or no, I'm sorry, try again. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? And of course it can read from text files. And again, all with accents and metering and pacing. And I'm not going to go deep into it. We're going to do a basic install, some basic demos. And, uh, you know, if all goes well, I'll, I'll, I'll have enough written that we could do the full two hours. It'll all depend on where I have to do this from. Uh, doing it from the in-laws place has many room and challenges and noise challenges. But if I get in there early enough to punch into a hotel where I can operate in the afternoon, then I'll be cool. All right, bunch of stuff popped up here. Whilst I was yammering. Are all those American artists? I've never heard of any of them. Yeah, you've heard of Steve Winwood. He's over there in Birmingham, my friend. Goodness gracious. A couple minutes drive from you. Okay, 350. I was just about on 350, so I was on 349. So we'll see what Kyle had to say. Probably haven't heard of it. <laughs> uh, 350, Kyle G. Favorite software for creating RPI Arduino circuit drag diagrams. <sighs> Brain farting on it. Uh, now I'm gonna have to look it up, sorry. I don't do a ton of it and that's why I don't have the name top of my, tip of my tongue, top of my tip. Just typing in stuff. 
Not shields. Oh, come on. Where are you? Not Uno. I'm sorry. I don't have the answer. Uh, it's an online one. Maybe add the word online to my handy dandy little search here. Exposure, EDA, circuit design for makers. On the not own a circuit simulator. I'm going to look at this one and then I'm going to give up if it's not there what I'm looking for. No, it's not circuit IO. I'm sorry, I don't have the answer for you. I don't do enough uh, PCB design uh, to have a favorite right now anyway. So apologies, I just don't have a good answer for you. Fritzing, thank you. It's Fritzing. Beep, 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 beep. Okay. That's the one I know the best. It may or may not be the best, but I understand it the best. <laughs> Kids these days. <laughs> Kids these days, I don't know what we're going to do with these kids today. Get off my yard. Fans of your forefathers. Well, you know, I'm just about old enough to be your dad. Not only a French accent, but he says, yes, I can say it with disdain and disgust. It's called Fritzing, F-R-I-T-Z-I-N-G. Uh, and it's fritzing.org, F-R-I-T-Z-I-N-G dot O-R-G. <laughs> okay lots of back and forth with each other okay nothing beats a pencil and paper uh yeah until you start doing multi-layer boards uh I, I would stop pencil and paper at four layers <laughs> and i would not like to do it at four layers we did two layers back in college that was all they had back in those days now Oh, gosh, I think the last time I played motherboard stuff, we were doing 10 layers. And I don't know where they're at right now, but they've got to be 14, 16 layers for the, the top end boards these days. <laughs> Paul is not. <laughs> McCartney died in the 60s and replaced by lookalike. Shame on you. Okay, Scott's posted the link to uh, fritzing.org. At 3.57. All right. Well, let's start winding up. If you've got any last minute questions, i got a minute or two to answer them. And otherwise, I'm going to have my ducks in a row for a change. There. It's in a row. Uh, Mike's show on Monday. He has not specified uh, any special feature topics. It'll be his usual Q&A. As you may or may not know, if you're not a, uh, a regular on Mike's show, I think everybody here is, but there's always uh, somebody watching on the archive or something like that. Uh, Mike has adjusted his show to be uh, no longer a committed two hours, but a minimum hour. If nothing's going on, things dry up in that hour, then he'll close it off at the hour. If he's got stuff going on, if there's a lot of questions or something like that, he'll run a little longer. But plan on two to three or so. Oh, no, not circuit boards, but just basic breadboards. Oh, man, I don't have a... a a favorite on breadboards. Breadboards are breadboards to my mind. I've got about five different models of breadboards laying around up here. All right, no new questions popped up. My ducks were in a row at one point and then someone yelled goose. Uh, I like hunting ducks in a row. It's just one shot. You get the whole brace. <laughs> no, conies are a brace, right? All right. So we wind it up a minute early or so and it's take a minute or so to wind it up and we'll go with that. So had a great time with you this week, next week, probably e-speak on the road. And remember the week after that is the big anniversary show. Please spread the word. I want to get a lot of participants in here. Uh, and I don't know if I'm going to do a feature or not, or if it's going to be something simple. If I do, uh, certainly not going to do anything complicated because I'm just really excited about the show. Hopefully I'll, get something cool and, and shiny up for backdrop as well. All right. And with that, oops, sorry, I went scrolling past some of these notes. Mike show. So as ever, many thanks to Mike Myers, 
Michael Smyer in the background, Scott doing yeoman's work in the background and all the work, total seminars. And most importantly, everybody who comes here to participate this was good having you all here. I am Dave Rush, senior instructor at Total Seminars, resident pie specialist, and I'm wishing you a great weekend. Take care of each other. Take serious steps to stay healthy. Call or visit your parents and the rest of your family. And never forget, technology is great, but you and I are the best resources that we have. Good night. We'll see you, hopefully some of you on Discord and at the AMA next week. And with that, I am out of here.